bad landing pages, uh, someone recently said, uh, Washington, D.C. is where good ideas go to die. <laughs> and uh, very, very smart guy said that. Um, bad landing pages are where good clicks go to die. So you spend all this time researching all these keywords, and you determine, you know what, headache, better than headaches. And for headache, this particular ad is the one that's getting the most traffic. And then you dump them on some generic site or page, right? That you may have spent 1% of your time thinking of relative to all the time you spent thinking about your bids and all the time you think about your match type and your creatives. And then you take them to this, this landing page. Um, I'm going to show you an example, actually, while I was listening to, uh, to Glenn's presentation, I searched for herbal cure for headache and clicked on something that I think could use some testing. Um, so when you think about your ad creatives, they're tiny, right? They take up a small percentage of the pixel space. People spend a few seconds looking at them. But we go into great detail in terms of, oh, we're going to have the perfect title, and we're going to have the right camel casing, and the perfect display URL. But then we take them to a landing page where, A, we've already paid for them. right? They're going to spend a lot more time, and they're going to see the entire page. And yet, that's the one that we put together last year. It's the same one we use for all our campaigns or for this ad group, and we don't really think much of it. So what we're arguing here is that landing pages are really an essential part of uh, your marketing campaign, specifically because Every visitor, if you have a bad ad in your PPC campaign, the worst case scenario is you're not going to get clicks, and you're going to have a, probably a high max uh, min CPC because quality is going to be low, which is, is tough. But you're not paying any money. If you have a bad landing page, every visitor that you paid to get there that you turned away because they weren't seeing what they were getting, that's flushing money down the toilet. So be really serious about your landing pages. Um, so how did you improve landing pages in the old days? One of the things is you just made cool ideas. You were, you're working on the weekend, and you're like, oh, you know, I'm going to have a, a talking avatar embedded in my landing, landing page, or I'm going to put a big gold guaranteed satisfaction seal. And you would just do it. And there's a certain instant gratification, because you go into HTML, you add the widget, you hit publish, and then you look at it, and you're like, oh, that looks better now. But you don't really know. And there are many cases where that actually could hurt. Um, there are many cases where you, you read someone's blog post that says, you know, green buttons are always better than red buttons or blue buttons. And you make that change, and you hope that it works, right? Uh, another one, which is more common with larger organizations, is what my uh, colleague Avinash Koshik calls the, the hippo, the, the highest paid person in the organization. <laughs> right? This is the guy or gal that, oh, I've been in marketing for 20 years, and uh, I have a degree from this fancy place, and I'm the boss. So the button's going to be blue. I know this. Just do it. Uh, that's another way that people used to make decisions. Um, and then there's the before and after, which is slightly evolved, which is where you make the change, and then you look at your sales afterwards. And if they went up, the change was good. And if they didn't, went down, then the change was bad. Of course, the problem with that is you don't know if those sales moved up or down necessarily because of that change. Maybe at the same time you made some simultaneous changes to your ad campaign. Or maybe at the same time there was a seasonal impact where you know, you're selling uh, sunscreen, and it, it naturally goes up from you know, May to June. And you happen to add the satisfaction guaranteed at the end of May. And then you look at the June numbers, and you're like, oh, I'm brilliant. You know, that, that, that seal worked. So that was another way to do it. Now, today, with Website Optimizer and other testing tools available, the customers visit your site. You can use the technology to split them into different groups. And you can say, well, I'm going to show one third the picture of the, the flowers with the, the model, and another third with just the flowers, and another third with the picture with the model and the lack of the green buttons. Right? And you don't really know which of those three would do better. 
you may just feel like, oh, well, maybe this one will do better. But until you run the test, and what the technology does is it'll send each person to a different version of the page. So Bob sees this one, Jane sees that one, Sam sees that one, and so forth. And then the technology will then track, well, what percentage of those who saw this version converted? And what percent who saw the other version converted? And then you find your winning combination. And so this is a much more evolved and sophisticated way of making web design decisions. It's no longer about guessing. It's no longer about who's been in marketing longer. It's no longer about who reads more blogs or has more advanced degrees or goes to more conferences. It's about what your customers want. 